Good morning. Danny Cox, a former jet pilot turned business leader in his book, Seize the Day, wrote that when jet fighters were first invented, they flew much faster than their propeller predecessors. So pilot ejection became a more sophisticated process. Theoretically, of course, all a pilot needed to do was push a button, clear the plane, and then roll forward out of the seat so the parachute would open. But there was a problem that popped up during testing. Some pilots, instead of letting go, would keep a grip on the seat. The parachute would remain trapped between the seat and the pilot's back. The engineers went back to the drawing board and came up with a solution. Cox recorded this. He said, the new design called for a two inch webbed strap, one end attached to the front edge of the seat under the pilot, the other end attached to, a, to an electronic take up reel behind the headrest. Two seconds after ejection, the electronic take up reel would immediately take up the slack and force the pilot forward out of his seat, thus freeing the parachute. Jet fighter pilots needed that device to launch them out of their chairs. The question for us as Christians, what will it take to launch us out of our chairs, particularly in difficult times? In this series, Learning to Thrive, Handling Tough Times, we want to continue today in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 down to verse 17. If you have your Bible with you, uh, either in digital form or printed form, I encourage you to grab that now, because we're going to read that passage in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, <clears throat> and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the gate. And then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. And then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and the gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them, of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so they said, <clears throat> let us rise and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But when Samballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and I said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. From this passage, I want us to consider 
four priorities, four priorities for responding to the circumstances of tough times. First, assess the situation. If you're gonna thrive in tough times, you must look honestly at your situation. A financial planner will help a person by exploring every expense, every debt, and every source of income. A career coach will review where a client is before recommending a career change. A relationship counselor will make an accurate assessment of problems before improvement advice can be made. There was a company that <clears throat> held an inter-office softball game every year between the marketing department and the support staff. Usually the marketing department won, but one year the support staff beat them and beat them badly. The marketing department took a lot of heat for losing the annual game. In response, someone in marketing decided to spin the results and published a news report on the company's bulletin board. And this is what it said. The marketing department is pleased to announce that we earned second place in the recent softball season after losing only one game all year. The support department, however, had a rough season, winning only one game. <clears throat> Listen, whether it's softball or something more important, an assessment of things is crucial. Verse 17 of our passage records that Nehemiah said, I said to them, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem is in, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. So first you have to assess the situation in order to move forward and respond to circumstances of tough times. Second, make the plan. The second part of verse 17 and then into verse 18. What was Nehemiah's plan? Well, we looked at it in our last, last time in our previous message. Wait, pray, start where you are and seize the moment. Then at the appropriate time, you must present the plan to those who will be involved with you. Look at, our, look at in our text, the last part of verse 17 and then into verse 18. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And then verse 18, and I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. In the King James Version, Proverbs 29 and verse 18 says this, and this is probably the best rendering, the King James Version rendering of this, of this uh, verse. Proverbs 2019, 29, 18 reads, where there is no vision, the people perish. Walt Disney had a plan to build an amusement park and his plan resulted in Disneyland in California. Then he planned Disney World just outside Orlando, Florida. Today, it occupies 47 square miles, an area about the size of San Francisco. By the time the park opened, Walt Disney had died. His wife was asked to speak at the grand opening. She was introduced by a man who said, Mrs. Disney, I just wish 
Walt could have seen this. Mrs. Disney stood up and said, he did, and sat down. Her speech was over. Through his plan, Walt Disney had already enjoyed Disney World through his vision of what he was going to build, how he imagined it would be when the work was done. He saw and he enjoyed it. So assess the situation, make the plan, and then third, support the effort. Alex Haley wrote, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. Carrying out a plan usually involves other people, helpers. And carrying out a plan usually encounters difficulties. If you're gonna get to the top of your fence post, with the help of others, there will need to be a lot of encouragement. Nehemiah was no different. Look at verse 17, uh, verse 19. But when Samballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard, at, heard it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? In tough times, the last thing you need is discouragement. The fear factor was introduced into the situation by the enemies of the rebuilding. Will you rebel against the king? Nehemiah stepped right up to the plate at that moment. And in verse 20, I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Encouragement is necessary. If we're going to thrive in life, especially during tough times. There was a young man in London who wanted to be a writer, but the cards really seemed to be stacked against him. He had only four years of schooling and his father <clears throat> and his father was in jail because he couldn't pay his debts. Just to survive the pain of hunger, he got a job pasting labels on bottles in a rat infested warehouse. He slept in an attic with two other boys from the slums. With such little confidence in himself and his ability to write, he secretly slipped out and mailed his first manuscript in the middle of the night so nobody would laugh at his dream. That manuscript, along with countless others, was rejected. Finally, one story was accepted. He wasn't paid anything, but the editor praised him for his writing. That one little compliment caused him to wander aimlessly through the streets with tears rolling down his cheeks. It inspired him to continue to improve and led to the brilliant writing career of Charles Dickens. So you have to assess the situation. You have to make a plan after you've assessed it. And then you gotta support the effort of all those who will be helping. And then fourth, you gotta stay the course. You gotta stay the course until the job is done. Under Nehemiah's leadership, the people began a 52-day project that proved to be 
harder than any of them had anticipated. They were the leanest of lean times and they weren't raising food for their families. They weren't taking care of the bills. They weren't getting things done at home because they were rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. They got discouraged, but Nehemiah kept them on course. One by one, each gate was up and finished. Block by block, each stone was back in place on the wall. They stayed the course because Nehemiah encouraged them to stay the course. And that got the job done. Max Lucado tells the story of the most sacred symbol in Oklahoma City. It's a tree, a sprawling, shade-bearing, 80-year-old American elm. Tourists drive for miles around to see her. People pose for pictures beneath her. Arborists carefully protect her. She adorns posters and letterhead. Other trees grow larger, fuller, even greener, but not one is equally cherished. The city treasures the tree, not because of her appearance, but her endurance. She endured the Oklahoma City bombing. Timothy McVeigh parked his death-laden truck only yards from her. His malice killed 168 people, wounded 850, destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah building, and buried that tree in rubble. No one expected it to survive. No one, in fact, gave any thought to the dusty branch strip tree, but then she began to bud. Sprouts pressed through damaged bark. Green leaves pushed away gray soot. Life resurrected from an acre of death. The tree modeled the resilience the victims desired. So they gave the elm tree a name. It's now known as the survivor tree. When Nehemiah challenged the people to rebuild the walls, they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. And how did they work? They used huge timber and massive stones. They used chisels and saws and hammers and pulleys. They worked to lift heavy stones. They worked from morning to night. They also carried their weapons with them everywhere they went, preparing to fight against the enemies while they worked. Listen, if God calls you to accomplish a heroic task, a God-sized task, then he expects you to work like a hero to do it. Consider the heroes of the Lord's work. Noah had to build an ark, and it took many, many years to complete it, like around 100 years, 100 plus years. Moses had to deal with stress levels that would have killed most men. Abraham had to walk across entire nations encouraged only by a dream, a promise of a future blessing. David had to battle as a warrior and struggle daily for years before arriving at the throne room of Israel in Jerusalem. Jesus had to labor in Joseph's carpentry shop as, his, as he prepared for his earthly ministry and his redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. Nehemiah is a book drenched with the sweat of hard work. When you dare to ask God to give you your dream, you better be prepared to work hard, extremely hard. 
This may sound like a strange way to end this message, but well, here goes. One evening, while a man was driving down a country road, he lost control of his car and he wound up in a ditch. He walked to the closest farmhouse and asked the help, asked for help pulling the car out of the ditch. The farmer said, sure, let me hitch up Dusty and you'll be out in no time. A few minutes later, the farmer appeared with Dusty, an old sway-backed, almost blind mule. After Dusty was hitched to the car, the old farmer cracked the whip and said, pull buck, pull. Nothing happened. And the stranger looked around for a mule named Buck. There weren't any other mules. There was only Dusty who wasn't moving. The farmer cracked the whip again and said, pull Clyde, pull. The stranger took another look, but there was still only one mule hitched to his car. And that mule's name wasn't Clyde. Nothing had happened. So the farmer cracked the whip again and said, pull Dusty, pull. Dusty began to pull until finally the car was out of the ditch. The man thanked the farmer and then said, but I'm really curious if your mule's name is Dusty, why didn't you say pull Buck and pull Clyde? That doesn't make sense. The farmer said, well, you know, Dusty is old and he doesn't see too good and he doesn't have much confidence. Why, if he thought he had to do all the work himself, he'd never even try. You see, just like Dusty, in tough times, you don't have to hunt, handle those times by yourself either. The God who helped Nehemiah and who helped Ezra is ready to help you as well. You simply need to ask him. Will you ask him? Will you put your tough times, whatever is going on in your life, whatever the issue is in your life, will you put it before him? And will you ask him to help you? And will you trust him to do it? To be strong on your behalf? Would you do that? Would you do that right now? Would you pray? Would you do business with God and just surrender your issues? Surrender your difficult time to him for his support and ministry. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the testimony of your servant Nehemiah, as well as uh, your servant Ezra, in build, rebuilding the temple. But thank you for the testimony of having a vision from you and then seeking your guidance and then seizing the day and encouraging others to see the vision and to work, to be encouraged in a great work. Father, thank you so much for that testimony. And Father, may that encourage each one of us, every one of us watching or listening to this message. Father, we seek your grace to be able to do a God-sized task, to be able to handle these tough times, these things that seem to be overwhelming, that seem to be beyond our resource, beyond our grasp. But Lord, we know they're in your grasp. But Father, we just look to you and ask you to give us what we need to seize this day. And Father, I just pray that you would do work in each one of our hearts. And it's in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You give that a whole lot of thought and you have a great day.